come and see, come and see, come and see the King of Love. See the purple robe and crown of thorns he wears. Soldiers mock, rulers sneer as he lifts the cruel cross. Lone and friendless, now he climbs towards the hill. We worship at your feet, where wrath and mercy meet, and the guilty world is washed by love's pure stream. For Luke 23, verses 33 and 34. When they came to the place that is called the skull, they crucified Jesus there with the criminals, one on his right and one on his left. Then Jesus said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. And they cast lots to divide his clothing. Traditionally, this is held as the very first sentence Jesus uttered on the cross, speaking to his Father, speaking to his God. Forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. I have often wanted to argue that they knew what they were doing, because they knew he would die. They knew he was being punished for something they thought they understood. But Jesus still argues they do not know what they are doing. Because whatever they were doing was meant for good, but they meant it as punishment. But perhaps for us it is important to think through what it means to be forgiven. Even for that which we do not know we are doing intentionally. Being prayed for, not simply for the people that were at the cross so many years ago, but for us too today, that even today and tomorrow and next week, Jesus continues to say, forgive them. They do not know what they are doing. As I said earlier, I find that difficult to work with. Because when speaking of grace, Paul deals with this question. Should we continue to sin so that grace may abound? Because he seems to think that some of the things we do are deliberate. Again, Jesus' words remain steadfast. Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. It appears as if Jesus suggests that it's not the rightness or wrongness of the act but that when something has been done, forgiveness from God has to be guaranteed through the pain that he endures. It appears as if he wants to assure us that his journey to the cross was to deal with the very things we think these are beyond repair, like a car condemned by the insurance. That when it comes to the children of God, there is no one beyond repair. There is no one beyond redemption. He says the pain is there. The hurt is there. But all the same, every one of these who didn't even say sorry, they deserve to be forgiven. 
It is good for the world that they be forgiven. It is good for you and I, Father. For this reconciliation to be there, it is good that they be forgiven. That is, they come to you, oh dear God, they don't come with guilt. They don't come with you with burdens. Forgive them. The detail of the confession is not even there. And I want us to understand as good Anglicans that these people were not even invited to baptism. <laughs> they were not invited to Holy Communion. They were not invited to, to confirmation. They were not at church. They were not on the parish roll. But Jesus still says, Father, forgive them. All of them. This is not specific to those on the pews, but to every one of us. Our forgiveness is guaranteed in Jesus because we are the beloved. Amen. Father, what amazing, scandalous love is this. They did not even say they were sorry. Yet Jesus says, Father, forgive them. Forgiveness without confession, without baptism, without confirmation. Your love for this world shown in the sacrifice of your Son, given to forgive. And no one is beyond repair. We can only bow our heads in awe. Thank you, Father that our forgiveness is guaranteed in Jesus because we are your beloved. And Jesus has given us the pattern for forgiveness. So we hold before you, God, those we need to forgive and those we have not been able to forgive. And we join in the words of our Saviour, Father, forgive them. Father, give us the grace to forgive them too. In the name of Jesus. Amen. My Lord, what love is this that pays so dearly that I the guilty one may go Salvation in a hopeless place. Truly I say to you, 
Today you will be with me in paradise. We are told that Jesus was on the cross with the two criminals. The writer of the Gospel of Luke does not mention the names of these criminals. What the writer makes clear is that one was on the right hand side and the other on the left. Both these criminals are listening to the soldiers mocking Christ. They are both witnessing Jesus being mocked and tortured. They are both equally close to Christ and they are both together with Christ in pain. But in the midst of this terrible experience, something special happens. While the one criminal joins the crowd with mocking Jesus, the other finds salvation in a hopeless place. The one criminal would die to be greeted into the promise of heaven, his longing for salvation. He doesn't need permission from anyone. This matter is personal and is between him and Christ. One criminal mocked and insulted Jesus, whilst the other took a different approach, asking, Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. This criminal was humiliated and acknowledged that he deserved to hang as he did. He, however, shows remarkable faith. He cries in repentance, Remember me when you come into your kingdom. What I find amazing about this criminal is that his faith was not affected by all the people that were mocking Jesus and that his request was not to be saved from death, but rather he wanted to be healed from sin. Even in his final breath, this criminal came to salvation. Jesus responds with a promise. I tell you the truth. Today you will be with me in paradise. Jesus does not remind him of his criminal acts or his past. Jesus did not tell him to go and get baptized first. Jesus did not think twice about his request. Jesus did not postpone his request for the following day or the month or year later. Instead, Jesus said without any doubt and hesitation, I will be with you today. He promised the sinner that he too would enter the gates of heaven to live in paradise, not later, but on that day. This was a profound moment because it was a representation of what Jesus was doing in that moment as he hung on the cross. Jesus was taking on sin and died for it. At the criminal's moment of suffering and death, he turned to Jesus for salvation, and Jesus accepted him and gave him a word of assurance that he would be with him in paradise. It was not late for the criminal to turn to Jesus and receive salvation, so in the same way, if we come to Christ in penitence, he will be with us in paradise. The grace that the criminal received is available for you too. Salvation is for everyone. Don't wait for tomorrow, for tomorrow may never come. You don't have to sit till the 11th hour to return back to Christ. Remember that his salvation is greater than our sins. If we confess our sins, he who is faithful and just will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Jesus enters into the reality of our ordinary existence. We are remembered, and right there, in the reality of everyday life, in the midst of our pain, in the midst of our dying, in the midst of our brokenness, Christ says to us, truly I tell you, today you will be with me in paradise. Amen. Jesus, remember me. Do you see my heartbreak, my fear, my pain, my loneliness? Like the thief on the cross, I too have been in a hopeless place. Jesus, remember me. I know it's never too late to confess my sin to you. 
I know that your grace is available to me too. It's never too late. And so I come to you. Jesus, remember me when you come into your kingdom. I receive your salvation. I receive your promise of paradise. Amen. At the cross her station keeping Stood the mournful mother weeping Close to Jesus to the last Through her heart his sorrow sharing All his bitter anguish bearing Now at length the sword has passed Oh how sad and sore distressed was that mother highly blessed of the soul begotten one christ above in torment hangs she beneath beholds the pangs of her dying glorious son a reading from the gospel of john chapter 19 beginning at the 25th verse. Meanwhile, standing near the cross of Jesus were his mother and his mother's sister, Mary the wife of Clopas and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing there with her, he said to his mother, Woman, here is your son. Then he said to the disciple, Here is your mother. And from that hour, the disciple took her into his home. I want to zoom out 2,000 years and imagine that we are on a tour around modern-day Turkey. But on our tour, we stop at some historical site that is, was the old city of Ephesus. And as we stop there and we look at the ruins, we have a tour guide who is with us. And the tour guide takes us to this one little building that is there. It's been restored. And he tells the story of an old nun who in the 1800s had a dream. And in her dream, Mary came to her and told her about the house in which she had lived her last years. This old nun, well, she told her friend, and her friend wrote down the story. Years later, someone picks up that story and decides to go to Ephesus because they have heard that Mary probably died in Ephesus. And they go hunting, and they find a dwelling place that matches to the picture that came from the dream. And that is the house that we would be looking at right now, that is called the House of Mary the Virgin. We then walk a little further and come to some other uh, ruins that are in the process of being restored, and we would be told that this was the Basilica of St. John the Apostle. And we would hear that in the reign of Justinian, this huge basilica that was the second largest church in the world at that time, was built over the place where John had died. And so here we have a beloved family that have spent the rest of the years after the crucifixion together, and they have died in this place. And as we stand here, our tour guide might tell us that John had probably written his epistles here in this place. He had also written his gospel. And if we're to imagine John writing his gospel, he would have been writing it in the latter years of his life. And he would have been pondering what his life with Jesus had been like, what Jesus' death had been like, and what life had been like since then. And as he did that, he would have been thinking about all the symbols and signs that Jesus had spoken of, and all of these would become entwined in what he would write. 
But as he begins to write about the crucifixion, the very first thing he describes is who was there? Who was there? There were women there who loved Jesus. And he was there. He was the only male witness of all our gospel writers to be there at the cross. And what does he record first? He records the moment that Jesus asks him to take Mary into his family. That moment that determined the rest of their life on earth together in relationship. And as we go to that place, we are perhaps not surprised because Jesus is as much the God of the Old Testament as he is the God of the New Testament. And God has called people through human history to care for the widow and the orphan. And here he was making provision for his mother. I'm interested that he didn't choose to leave his mother to his brothers. He, they, they would have been part of his family. His brother, James, would have become the leader of the church in Jerusalem. He would have written one of the letters that we find in the New Testament. But James did not yet believe. And so Jesus leaves his mother to the man he knows will understand the way forward within the kingdom of God. But he also probably knew that John needed a mother who would really love him in the ways that Mary had really loved Jesus and that she would be able to provide a safe space for him to do the ministry that he was being called to do, the ministry we know about today. We know today that we need to abide in Christ in the vine because of the words and experiences of John. And so here at the cross, in this painful moment, Jesus is beginning a new community. It is the beginnings in some ways of what will become the church, a place of love, a place of deep relationship in Christ, and something that will last a lifetime and on into eternity. And so that is God's gift to us in the cross as well, the opportunity to become part of his family. We've heard about baptism in both of the previous addresses that we've had. And in baptism, we come in to be part of that body of Christ or the family of God. And this is part of that gift that comes to us. Amen. Holy Jesus, we are here. We stand beside your cross like Mary, your mother, and the faithful women, and John, members of the new community you began at the cross. As you made provision for your mother, we remember all mothers who are left without provision after the loss of a child. We remember too the widows we remember the orphans, and we pray that you will inspire us, your church, to reach out like you did, even when we ourselves are struggling with compassionate care for those who suffer. Amen. My God, my God, my God.
lost. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? That's a, a cry wrung from the heart. It's truly the utterance of a man abandoned and deserted by those he loves. Yes, as we have just heard, his mother Mary, Mary Magdalene, and one or two others, as well as the beloved disciple John, are still there. But all the others have fled. Far worse, however, is is the feeling that he has been abandoned by the Father from whom his very life and power have sprung. Throughout John's Gospel especially, Jesus talks about the Father's being in him and he in the Father, so that he and the Father are one. Now, he is excruciatingly aware that the Father's presence in his life has gone. It is no longer there. Eloi, Eloi, lama sabachthani, my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The, the true import of this saying really only dawned on me about ten years ago when we were part of a group of pilgrims touring the Holy Land. We were in Jerusalem, in the church of St. Peter Gallicantu, which means St. Peter Cockcrow, and is the church that was built on the site of the high priest's house where Peter betrayed Jesus before the cock crowed. And we were discussing with the other pilgrims there Peter's betrayal and the crucifixion itself. And suddenly it struck me, with an almost physical force, just what this anguished cry of Jesus truly meant. For the first and only time in all eternity, the unity of the Trinity was broken. The Father was there, the Holy Spirit was there, but the Son was not, and he had been sacrificed deliberately as a result of the Father's love for his creation. The thought appalled me, and I remember feeling emotion welling up in my throat, making it almost impossible to speak. The one, indivisible, eternal trinity of Father, Son and Holy Spirit was in that instant of time no more. And yet, in a bizarre kind of parody, there the Trinity was still, in three crosses, silhouetted against the sky. The more I pondered on that, the more aware I became of the immensity of the sacrifice God made for our sake. In the beginning was the Word, John tells us. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. But now the Word was isolated and abandoned, hanging on a cruel instrument of torture and death. The Word had indeed become a curse in Jewish theology. The pain a parent feels on losing a child can only dimly compare to the pain that God the Father experienced as his son hung on that cross. Eloi, Eloi. And the Father turned his face away as the Son gave up his spirit. Amazing love. How can it be? But of course, we are privileged to know how the story ends. And we can look beyond the pain and agony of spiritual abandonment to that glorious resurrection morn. 
The power of death was broken and the Son, infused with new life from the Father, rose again to restore the unity of the Trinity and to bestow that same gift of life on us who believe. Hallelujah. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me so that we, sinners though we are, may become sisters and brothers of Christ and heirs of salvation. That was the price that was paid. Dare we shun it. Amen. Jesus, your cry of despair, wrung from the heart, echoes down the ages. It's a very human cry, a cry of abandonment, a cry of despair, the cry of so many, even today. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? The relationship broken, the intimacy severed, the loneliness overwhelming, Jesus, you know what human desperation feels like. You too were alone and shattered and despairing. You identified with us so completely. You paid the ultimate price for us. Thank you. Amen. One day I came to him, I was so thirsty. I asked for water, my throat was so dry. He gave me water that I had never dreamed of. For this water, my Lord had to die. He said, I thirst, yet he made the rivers. He said, I thirst, yet he made the sea. Said the king of the ages In his great thirst He brought water to me We read in John chapter 19 and verse 28 After that, knowing all that was done And scripture fulfilled he said, I am thirsty. In this place of abandonment, Jesus says, I thirst. What does this say to you? What does it evoke in you? I thirst. Can you recall a time when you were very thirsty? so thirsty your only desire is to find something to drink even if you have to forego chocolate you are looking for water something to quench your thirst because thirst demands our attention it cannot be put off you cannot say oh well I'll drink later when I've got time Thirst demands your attention now. Jesus says, I thirst. And he relied upon the two soldiers to relieve his thirst. They gave him wine vinegar on a sponge. And the wine vinegar and the sponge were part of possibly their army issue. They were things which belonged to them. 
The wine vinegar was there to quench their own thirst. The sponge, which could sometimes have been used to protect their heads and their helmets, was also used as a, a vessel for drinking from. And so they used their own wine vinegar and their own sponge to give Jesus something to drink. Now, they had no reason to do this. What was it that made them give of themselves to this man deemed a criminal on the cross? What was it that made them merciful to the one, the author of mercy? And we see then that even when Jesus was hanging on the cross, he was invitational. He was allowing people to come in and to tend to him in the same way that he calls us to tend to others. So how do you respond to this call of I thirst? What does that mean for you today? How does Jesus thirst today? What is the thirst of God? What is his deepest desire today? What is God's complete and utter focus in this time? I thirst. God's deepest thirst, Jesus' deepest thirst, is for us. Jesus hung on the cross because of God's eternal thirst for us. God's desire is that he be with us, that he share our lives in a deep intimacy. When we come into a relationship with God, we are changed, we are transformed. And because of that, we're able to transform the world around us. It is Christ's deepest thirst that the world change. But it can only change through you and through me as we respond to the thirst of Christ for us. Only you and I can quench this thirst by giving of ourselves, just as the soldiers gave of their own equipment to quench his thirst. And so we have to respond to this deep call, his deep desire for us. His great desire that we be with him. Only through our thirst for him and for his spirit are we able to be a light to the world? If we thirst for God in the same way that we would thirst for quenching water, if it became for us the center, the pivot of our lives, then we would begin to understand the call of Jesus for us and for his work on earth. Jesus hangs on the cross and he says, I thirst for you. For what do you thirst? Jesus, as you thirsted on the cross, you thirst today for us. May we be like the soldiers, offering ourselves and our resources to you. And may we thirst too for you and for the power of your spirit, so that we might be filled to the brim and be your witnesses in this dark and thirsty world. Amen. Glory be to Jesus Who in bitter pains Poured for me the life
blood from his sacred veins. Grace and life eternal in that blood I find. Blessed be compassion infinitely kind blessed through endless ages be the precious stream which from endless toil Did the world redeem? Jesus does not take us down from our cross. Instead, he gets up on the cross with us. When Jesus had received the wine, he said, It is finished. Then he bowed his head and gave up his spirit. This is truth beyond the words we hear, beyond the man the crowd saw. That was it. It was finished. It was hours since Jesus was arrested, tied up, interrogated, tortured and executed. The cross he hung on was a story of suffering and death. It was however interesting that this brutal death would soon bring hope and be the centerpiece of our faith. Some say that Jesus suffered and died because we are so bad. I disagree. I think Jesus suffered and died because we suffer and die. Who among us has not suffered or felt some loss or sorrow? Who here has not wept and felt it was done? powerless at the suffering of loss and pain. It is finished. Remember that at this point, no one could recognize Jesus' face because he had been whipped and beaten, and there he was wearing a crown of thorns. The cross that he hung on is not, however, exclusive to Jesus. It is also our story. The person who is beaten and abused. The person who has been broken. The person who is mocked. The person who is cut and bleeding. The person who is a victim of violence and injustice. The person who is in pain and suffering. The person who is abandoned, betrayed, denied. The person who stands alone in silence. In that it is finished moment, do you think people recognized Jesus' pain and his brokenness? Jesus knew at this point that he had fulfilled everything that he needed to fulfill, and he said, it is finished. Jesus is the image and the reflection of our own lives, our losses, our pain and suffering, our brokenness and our loneliness. His story is the human story, and the cross stands in the middle of the story. We have a God who meets us in our suffering. That's why we cling to the glory in the cross of Christ. Jesus was most real, most human, most embodied, and identified with us when he was on the cross and said it was finished. It is in those words of suffering and dying, and it continues to be in our suffering and dying. If we are unable to recognize that Jesus meets us in suffering and loss, and that Jesus on the cross in those final moments is the personification of all of us, then the passion of our Lord Jesus Christ is just another tragic story, just another sad tale at which we shake our heads and wonder when and how any of this will ever change. Jesus hung there on the cross and said, it is finished. 
because Jesus is the Son of Man, the human one, the mirror in which we see the truth of our own pain, the suffering of all people, the brokenness of the world, the violence that destroys and the tragic reality of death. This moment of suffering and agony would later on have Thomas look at Jesus' wounds and proclaim, my Lord and my God, here is the man, here is the one who is truly and fully human because he and the Father are one. If we have seen him, we have seen the Father. That is the peace that fills his silence, the strength that allows him to embrace and cling onto the cross. It's the compassion that despite the suffering, he unites with his mother. Here we see the companionship that stands next to his loneliness. We hear the victory in his words, it is finished. And we receive the life he offers when he gives up his last breath and his spirit. Good Friday does not offer answers or an escape from our sufferings. It's uncomfortable. But there in the middle of our it is finished moments stands the cross. That dignity, that peace, the strength, compassion, companionship, victory and life are the very presence of God. God is not distant in that pain, suffering or even death. God is here. Remember, only by coming close enough to be entangled by the cycle of human pain and suffering, human violence, human death, does God get near enough to break the cycle with divine healing, reconciliation and restoration. Jesus does not take us down from our cross. Instead, he gets up on the cross with us. Remember that Christ has embraced the cross of suffering and death and transformed it into the tree of life. The wooden cross where Jesus hung and said, it is finished, now flowers with the hope and the possibilities for healing, reconciliation and restoration for our own lives. Jesus does not take us down from the cross, but instead he gets up on the cross with us so that we might be set free. It is finished. Then Jesus bowed his head and gave up his spirit. Amen. Jesus, you suffered and died because we suffer and die. As we see you on the cross, we see the image and reflection of our own losses, our pain and suffering, our brokenness, our loneliness. You meet us in our suffering. Your cross stands at the center of all our human anguish. We thank you for coming close enough to break the cycle of human violence with your divine healing. The tree of death became the tree of life for us. Thank you, Lord. Amen.
Luke 23, 46. Then Jesus, crying with a loud voice, said, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. I want us to imagine that as Jesus is saying this, perhaps tied to what we just had now, the it is finished moment. I want us to look at these two together as we lead from what Nobuhle has just said to us. Because the it is finished moment in its Greek version is an accounting term, tetelestai, which means it is fully paid for. It is a kind of invoice someone with debt would have received when they have paid their debt in full and they get a receipt that says, your house, your dirt, whatever you were doing is completely paid for. Here is the evidence. So I want us then to see now Jesus holding the evidence as preached to us now that it is finished. Then goes to the Father and say, having made sure that what needs to be done with God's people has been delivered, now I want to commend my spirit to you. Almost to remind us of what was said earlier by John when he pointed out that there was this great separation of the community of the Trinity. Jesus saying, I come back. But in coming back, because he has paid in full, Jesus does not join the community of the Trinity alone. He comes having paid the debt for all these people. He doesn't come alone. He comes with the family. Oftentimes it has been beautiful to imagine the Trinity holy and distant. But in this moment, even I am in there. Even you are in there. Jesus comes with all of us because through him, he paid the debt in full. It is empowering to know that we are welcome in the presence of God anytime because the debt was paid and when Jesus commended himself back to the Father, you were a part of that commendation. When Jesus committed his spirit, you were made part of that relationship because to be able to commend his spirit, it's because they had a relationship. I want therefore to suggest that perhaps we need to work on this relationship with God that we too are able to say for ourselves, I commend my spirit to you. Yes, as an Anglican priest, it gives me great joy to do the last rites with somebody. And in the old liturgy, you would then say, much on, Christian soldier. But I would rather, having been invited, that even as we live through the day, not because we are dying, but as we live through the day, you are able to wake up every morning or go to bed every night and say, into your hands, I commit my spirit. Because I know now I am welcome in the community of the Trinity because the debt was paid for in full. So this is an invitation to all of us. This is an invitation even to that person sitting at home thinking, I really haven't been to church for a long time. Thinking I haven't said my prayers. Actually, I haven't done that well. Even for that too, Jesus commended himself with you back into the community of the Trinity. We are welcome. I invite you to commend yourself, therefore, as you listen to us today. Thanking God for Good Friday, hence it's good. It would have been said then, but it's not actually said for us. It's good. Something good happened. And may we embrace that goodness, therefore, as we for ourselves commit ourselves, perhaps, and commit each other back with Jesus. 
as he commits himself to the community of the Trinity, we join Jesus, our friend, who was prepared to pay it all for us. None is excluded. Father, to you I commend my spirit. And I'm imagining maybe somebody, or even your child, who have commended and committed themselves perhaps to pushing drugs. They've committed themselves to things that don't make us really, really proud. But it's a moment to come out of that and commend ourselves to God with Jesus who forgives even before we say sorry to the one who was thirsty even for this one who thought they were destined. The invitation remains. We commend ourselves with Jesus. Amen. You have paid our debt in full. Thank you, Jesus. You have been restored to the Father, and you bring us with you, making us members of your family. And so we accept God's invitation. Into God's hands we commit our spirit. We enter again into that relationship with God, the three in one, knowing that we are welcome, knowing that we are free, knowing that you have done it all for us, and we are thankful. Amen. What has washed away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And what has made me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus.
Friends, we do not say goodbye to this moment. As Sue reminded us of the women and John who remained at the foot of the cross with Jesus hanging in pain, I invite us to a moment of reflection. If you have a cross in your home, but even if you don't, you could do this at your coffee table, at your study table, and imagine yourself with Mary and the other women and John at the foot of the cross. Trying for yourself to understand, but what does this mean then? At that point, it's not a pretty sight. It's a sight of death. There is blood. There is pain. But you have chosen to stay. And perhaps, like Barnabas was released because of Jesus, you look at the cross and say, that should have been me. But I'm not there because Jesus has done it for me. What does that mean there? How do I respond to this act? Do I respond with thanksgiving? Do I respond with prayer? Do I respond with service for others? Do I respond with forgiveness? Do I respond by releasing those that I've bound? What do I do as I become aware that all this was for me, just for me? Amen.